Hello everyone, I'm Dr. Angela Puca and welcome to my live stream symposium. I'm a PhD and a university lecturer and this is your online resource for the academic study of magic, esotericism, shamanism, paganism and all things occult. Basically every religious tradition that includes some kind of magic. So let me see who is in the chat. I'm pretty uh, excited because in a couple of weeks I will be going to Ireland and I'm sure something very exciting is going to happen. A few things actually. I definitely have um, I have two conferences, the European Conference or the EASR Conference, which is the European Association for the Study of Religions and the SWE Conference, which is the European Society for the Study of Western Hystericism. In uh, Among academics, we tend to just say SWE conference and EASR conference, but I am aware that outside of academic circles, people people don't know about what, what is it. So um, let me see who is in the chat. Um, hi, Andrew, <laughs> and thanks for moderating the chat along with uh, Academic Police. Hello, Academic Police as well. And hi, Edward. Nice to see a few of my patrons in the chat. Um, hello from Newport. <laughs> yeah, you have moved recently, if I recall correctly. Hi, Kissing Embers. Mm. Hello, Carl. Greetings, happy Sunday. <laughs> So, um, as uh, surely the um, moderators will uh, tell you, oh, hi, Tony. And hi, Joao. Nice to see you in the chat. Um, so, uh, the, the best way to make sure that your questions get answered is to super chat them. So, the, to use the super chat fe feature to ask your questions. But otherwise, uh, just write question in capital letters uh, first and then your question after. So, that it's easier for me to spot your question because, of course, you will also be um, talking amongst yourself, which is totally fine, but it makes a bit easier for me to spot your question and if there's anything that I'm missing because it always seems like when I go back to the chat in previous live streams I always realize that there are things that I for some reason I didn't even see so I apologize if that happens but as I said the, um, I, I don't do that on purpose <laughs> first of all and um, again the best way is to super chat your your questions that way they are very visible to me and you will be helping the the channel and uh, you know it's um it will be very easy for me to spot the question and answer it so um would you be doing something with jenny butler uh, when when in ireland um I adore Jenny. <laughs> Jenny and I are friends and she's actually the organizer of both conferences along with uh, Dr. James Capallo, who has also been on my YouTube channel. If you recall, uh, there was an interview on the folk magic in the Republic of Moldova and uh, he was interviewed on my channel as well. So they are organizing these two conferences. I, I think definitely the YASR conference, the SWE conference, maybe it's just Jenny. I'm not completely sure. But yeah, I will be seeing her and I'm not sure how busy she will be since she's organizing two conferences, but I will definitely try to have her on, on the channel and uh, to do to have drinks together and uh, have fun together. We also have academic fun in private as academics, you know, so <laughs> especially at conferences. So that's I really look forward to that. I am a bit worried about the flight situation at the moment because I don't know um, if it is the same where you live, but uh, here in the UK, it's quite it's been quite difficult. There are um, there have been quite a few flights cancelled, and so I am a bit worried about that. But hopefully, you know, send me all of your positive vibes, guys. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, as uh, Andrew is also saying, uh, it's best to start your question with question in um, caps lock. So let me see if there aren't any. Okay, so Tony Knuckle <laughs> is asking, is it allowed for 
a philosophy thesis, master's or PhD, to contain elements from mysticism, historicism, uh, and religion altogether? Oh, this is a great question. I, uh, I'm glad that you asked. So uh, the answer is yes, but uh, of course you will have to address these matters from an academic point of view. So the, I think that this is one of the things that especially those who are not academics in the field and gen the general public, I say because I also personally find this to be a challenge when I have to explain people what I do for a living. But um, I think that there is an idea that um, in that science or academia only treats and covers and studies certain topics, whereas um, academia, provided their, their, their funding, uh, will is able to study and address and tackle everything. So what really changes and what makes it an academic piece is the methodology and of course the peer review process, but uh, here we are talking about uh, a thesis. So yes, you can uh, con you can include elements from mysticism and esotericism, but it depends how you want to include them. So it's not it, it will not be about your personal experience. It will be depending on the kind of discipline that you are writing your master's thesis or your PhD in. Um, you will have a very specific methodology, so you could address that. Um, in uh, in the field of history of religion and in that case you will trace the history of a specific tradition or a specific part of a tradition based on documents or you could address it from um, a sociology of religion point of view which means that you will uh, look at the contemporary world but even in the in the past and uh, see the impact that a specific religious specific religious behaviors and uh, beliefs have on society the wider impact of certain religious practices and beliefs or you could do anthropology of religion which is what i do uh, which means that you would go and um, do participant observation with practitioners, stay with them, uh, even undertake initiations and uh, attend practices and gather data as to what are the um, behavior and how people make meaning out of their beliefs and practices. So, uh, and, and then you have like archaeology. Archaeology is also a way of addressing um, religious matters but uh, in the past, so in the contemporary world, you would do anthropology and stay with people and understand what people do. In the past, you would do archaeology and um, still try and understand people's behavior. But obviously, since it is in the past, you need to uh, gather it in different way, in a different way. So I hope that answers your question. So Edward, nice to see you here. Uh, Edward is also a patron. Is there a journal a journal of academic esoteric research you recommend well there are multiple journals that um, address matters in esotericism so i'd say the famous one is aries aries spelled um a r i e um s and um yeah, Eris is a, a journal that uh, studies esotericism, but there are quite a few actually. Um, and you can find elements of esotericism even across the journals, you know, journals that uh, are about religious studies, but not specifically esotericism. Um, but uh, yeah, I say the Eris series, uh, both the, the series in the Brill. Uh, Brill is an academic publisher. So Brill has a series on um, a series of books on Western historicism, but there is also a journal called uh, in the same way, and it uh, treats matters uh, that regard um, that are about historicism. Uh, but yeah, I have um, a vague memory that there is another one called Correspondences. I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not misremembering. But I have posted something from this journal uh, from this journal on my Facebook page. So let me see if there are other questions. <laughs> so Alan Don Don Saji uh, is asking, uh, "What is true Satanism?" 
Uh, well, to answer this question, I would recommend you watch my video about um, what is a true religion. I think it's um, living versus institutionalized religions. I can't remember the exact name, but um, Andrew, please uh, post it in the <laughs> in the chat box. So um, I made a video on what constitutes a, a true Christian or a true pagan. And you really, from a researcher's point of view, from an academic point of view, you definitely don't have a way of saying uh, who is a, a true um, who, who is a, a true Christian or a true pagan uh, because there is a difference between the institutionalized religion and in some cases like with monotheisms you would have a very you would have a central dogma you have an institutionalized um, theology whereas with other religions like with, uh, such as paganism you don't even have that so it makes it even more complicated but even when it comes to christianity or monotheistic religions or religions that have a central dogma and a central institutions that dictates uh, or has the primary uh, voice with regards to uh, its theology you will still find that people who identify as part of that religion will interpret that religion and that theology in their own way so there is always a different a difference between the living experience of people and the institutionalized religion so with satanism you have different forms of satanism so you have the atheistic satanism like the laveian satanism and you have the theistic satanism which is um, a form of satanism that worships or works with uh, satan as a as a, a deity as an entity uh, and also in in Italy, which uh, which is where I do my field work, there is also a form of spiritual Satanism uh, that uh, tends to include elements from paganism, which is quite interesting. So you have different forms of Satanism. I wouldn't say that there is a true one. Um, let me see whether there are other question. Oh, we have another on true something <laughs> you guys are particularly interested in the concept of truth <laughs> uh tonight but um or this evening or this morning <laughs> i guess it depends on where you are at the moment so uh, what is true occult according to academics what can be achieved from it so academics don't evaluate what true occultism is so I, as I mentioned earlier, you can study the occult from the point of view of different disciplines. So I guess that when it comes to, for instance, for instance, the history of religion, then you could say that there are certain things that practitioners claim that are not historically accurate. So maybe you could interpret that as not being true, but um, I would say that uh, a best way of, of explaining what we are talking about is that it's not accurate knowledge. So, for instance, when um, in Wicca they claim, Gerald Gardner claimed that uh, it was a, a tradition, an unchanging tradition from the beginning of times, and it was um, highly, you know, clearly disproven by historians, including uh, Professor Ronald Hutton. That is an inaccuracy, but it, it, it's not the same as saying that it's not true occult. Um, so I think that the concept of true occult is not something that academics are engaged with as a, it's such an ontological question. <laughs> is there even a truth? I mean, so um, no, it's not something that academics study. Maybe you mean whether scientists have proven magic scientifically? But that would be a completely different uh, topic. And I, I would argue that um, magic practices uh, elude a certain... Uh, they are not... Um, the, the method of natural science is not the best way to study those kind of practices. That's what I'd argue. But that's a, a very um, complex topic. And it could take me two hours to talk about it. Oh yeah, Astro Gypsy, who's also another patron of mine. Um, nice to see you here. True is a tricky word, but there are two main schools. One is theist and one is secular. So let me see if there are other questions. Oh, 
<laughs> Thank you, Tony. That's nice of you. <laughs> Did Alastair Crowley have sex with goats? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but he had sex with a lot of things <laughs> and people, so <laughs> who knows? Oh, uh, thanks, uh, Crepuscular Soul, for the reading recommendation. Okay, I don't know how to pronounce your nickname. Uh, Nkrama Lucian <laughs> is asking, uh, can you share a bit about um, the relationship of the Catholic Church and Italian witchcraft historically and now? Mm. Mm. Actually, there's a chapter in my PhD dissertation about this the relationship between well, it was um, the chapter was about the, the relationship between the Catholic Church and shamanism, and then I also included Italian witchcraft. So to uh, give you a brief answer, the Catholic Church doesn't seem particularly um, opposed to shamanism. In fact, um, you know the the, the Pope now. Um, has also hosted the um, the uh, Pan Amazonian Synod in in Rome, I think, a couple of years ago, and uh, there were also statuettes of the uh, the Pachamama that were brought into um, a specific church in Rome. But unfortunately, you know, um, there were people that just threw them in the um, in the river because uh, they thought it was um, heresy. But the, it seems that there isn't a great deal of conflict between the Catholic Church and shamanism. I think the shamanism has um, sort of a, a good reputation <laughs> in a way. So um, there is this kind of, you know, that you have that the, the idea of the witch and witchcraft has a history of antagonism with the with Catholicism and with Christianity, and they are seen in in opposition. Whereas um, the figure of the shaman is seen in a more positive light as a healer, as a helper, as non-religious. And so, if you perceive um, shamanism or the figure of the shaman as non-religious, it, it it is perceived as less threatening by some. Um, Christians. So um, my conclusion was that in terms of shamanism, there wasn't a great deal of conflict. But when it comes with, Ita with Italian witchcraft, the term witchcraft being the operative term here, in that case, yes, you do find conflict between what the Catholic Church says and, you know, Italian witchcraft. So it, it is not deemed as something that you are allowed to do as a, as a Catholic. However, especially the old generation of segnatori and segnatrici, so the practitioners of the form of vernacular healing and folk witchcraft that I studied, they are strongly Catholic and they use the Trinity and the saints and um, a lot of elements from Catholicism in their practice. So they would say that they are uh, extremely Catholic, but the Catholic Church wouldn't really um, endorse or approve of their practices. I hope that answers your question. So, <laughs> what do you think of the religious magical dimensions of Bitcoin followers? Well, you've got to expand more on that. <laughs> what does it mean, Bitcoin followers? <laughs> But um, this reminds me, I'm not sure how related it is to your question, but it reminds me that I have been, uh, that, that I will be working on uh, technology and magic and witchcraft and um, even the concept of artificial intelligence and uh, witchcraft. And these are things that I'm, I might, uh, it, it is quite likely that, luckily, I guess also luckily, likely <laughs> that I will be working on them in the um, in the future, in the near future. And there's also a, a patron of mine, uh, Dave. Uh, hi, if you're listening. Uh, he also uh, quite an expert on the matter. And Andrew also, uh, who is here, uh, he's a fond of the idea of. Uh, I don't know if I can say it out loud because we will be working on that um, in, in in a for a paper. 
in the future. But uh, yeah, Andrew, if you give me consent to saying what it is, the um, hypothesis that you <laughs> have formulated, I can say that. Oh, hi, James. <laughs> Thank you so much for the, um, for the super chat. Hope you're okay. So let me see if there are any other questions. Any thoughts on the idea of the Hermetic Kabbalah, whether it is cultural appropriation of Jewish of Jewish mysticism? Hmm, I'd like to have a conversation on that with Justin, actually. But this is another pending video that I have to make. Is the one on cultural appropriation that is long overdue, uh, but uh, I'm always so busy that. I haven't found the time yet, but it's definitely something that I, I want to work on, or a video on cultural appropriation. Uh, so I don't think that it is, but I will have, um, I will present all of my arguments as to what constitutes cultural appropriation in a dedicated video. I think that cultural appropriation is a very delicate matter, and I think that lately it has been overused and thrown around a lot. Everything is cultural appropriation, <laughs> um, and uh, there are certain characteristics and certain traits that uh, scholars um, and, you know, um, identify as um, cultural appropriation as opposed to not. Uh, one of these is to take advantage and uh, exploit a culture to earn money out of it. Or, um, you know, there is also an, there is an element of disrespect towards a culture that is not your own and also appropriating something to, um, you know, to gain some to, to gain financial um, to have financial gain out of it. But um, the matter is quite complex and I don't want to make it to oversimplify so uh, please bear with me and there will be a video on cultural appropriation hopefully by the end of the summer Let me see if there are other questions. So, do you see witchcraft as purely a religious or spiritual movement, or are secular witches valid? And if so, what makes one a witch? This is a very good question and very complex. Uh, so, whether witchcraft is religious depends on um, well, it depends on the practitioner and it depends on the definition that you give of religion. Up until recently, I think that by term by the term religion, people tend to mean the three main monotheistic religions plus uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. But now, even among religious studies scholars, um, we are discussing you know, the the fact that the term religions um, needs to be, well, it's not recent actually in religious studies, it's quite old as a debate, but it hasn't reached the um, general public yet. This is one of the things that it's a bit, uh, it's a pity, and one of the reasons why I have this channel is that there are certain conversations that happen in academia that reach the general public decades later sometimes, and that is totally our fault because we need to be um, in a better, you, you know, we need to establish a better communication with the general public. But uh, yeah, there have been for quite some time debates on religion and uh, yes, definitely uh, witchcraft can be religious. For instance, 
when there is uh, the inclusion working with deities is something that is religious and also it depends on whether the practitioner has a certain belief system that includes religious elements but that also really depends on how you define religion um, and also how the person perhaps perceives their practice and as for secular witches well i i don't think the scholars are the ones that should say whether they are valid or not i would say that any belief system and any religious religious belief and religious practice is valid because uh, religion is ultimately about belief making and meaning making and trying to navigate the world and reality and our experience on this earth in a way that is meaningful and that goes beyond what we goes beyond the mundane world it has to do with the sacred with a sacred perception of what we are doing and what we are interacting with so um yeah i say that even secular witches of course are valid even though as i said i don't think that's uh, something that scholars um should really say whether somebody is why you know what scholars could do for instance would be to assess whether the way certain practitioners use certain terms or certain claims whether they are accurate or not um, based on the history and based on other facts but it's not about validating a religious or a spiritual practice because that is something um, incredibly personal so what makes one a witch <laughs> is also um, very difficult to answer um, because it, it, in this case it depends on how you define witchcraft and also there are practitioners that would do that would practice something that I would define as witchcraft but they would not define it as such so um, it's a bit complicated and here there's a, a difference between the amic perspective and the ethic or ethic perspective uh, which is the difference between how practitioners define their practice and how um, scholars define their practice and uh, so <sighs> I know that lately by witchcraft um, practitioners have been intending a folk European tradition or something that derives from folk European practices. I'm not completely sure whether that's historically accurate, but um, again, as I said, it, it also depends on how you define the term witch. So for now, for simplicity and to be I guess an accepting in inclusive anthropologist I would say that um, what makes a witch is somebody self-identifying as a witch so oh sorry uh, what may what may be the antiquity of the various hierarchies and names of the spirits mentioned in the 17th century Solomonic magic mm, by antiquity you mean how old are they um, as for the hierarchies this is something that is mentioned in the Goetia uh, but all the all the, the demons uh, mentioned in the Goetia or the, the spirits the uh, angelic forms and the planetary um, influences in the um, greater key of solomon yeah they they have different origins it's quite complex so i'm afraid i cannot answer that uh, quite concisely and yeah as academic police <laughs> is reminding um, us please remember to like and subscribe So, um, Kissing Embers is asking, do you see any parallels between Amaru, the feathered serpent, um, the feathered serpent god from South America, and uh, Chalkindri that are supposed to reside on the sun with a phoenix? No. <laughs> but this gives me the, the chance to... Uh, talk once again about the matter of perennialism which is something that i have talked 
um, that I've mentioned a few times here on the channel. So the idea that uh, there is one core underlying truth or there is one God that manifests in different forms across cultures and uh, across traditions and um, across the ages. So it is a sort of unitarian view that there is an underlying truth or an underlying um, de deity or divine entity that uh, manifests in different ways, but is actually the same thing. So this is a concept that is extremely popular among practitioners, and it is the exact opposite of what we do in academia. And not because that is not a valid belief, because of course, as I mentioned earlier, every belief is valid if it gives you meaning and it brings value in your life and in your religious practice and in your worldview, that is valid. But uh, what I mean is that academics tend to, our aim is to acquire the most accurate knowledge that we can. Uh, and of course, that is done in different ways, depending on the discipline. When it comes to deities and when it comes to cultural to entities or um, divine beings that are associated to a specific culture and a specific time, for us, the details, the context is extremely important, is of the essence, whereas a perennialist would tend to dismiss the cultural elements to find uh, the similarity and say, OK, it's the same thing because there is this underlying similarity. Whereas academics, since we want to gather the most accurate knowledge and the most contextualized knowledge, because um, in you know for academics the context is extremely important in get in gathering accurate knowledge, then we would do the exact opposite process. So I would say no. <laughs> um, hmm. So Kabbalah is based on the statement that the Torah is word for word, letter for letter, the word of God. With our current knowledge of the Torah, we know that this claim is untainable. Well, it is a matter of belief, I'd say. Hmm. Have you done research on gypsy magic or practices of the Romani people, I guess? Uh, if so, please discuss. No, unfortunately, I haven't. And I don't, I'm not sure it is related, but I would uh, recommend watching the interview with Dr. James Capolo, which I have mentioned earlier. Um, oh, I'm, you're welcome. Glad you appreciated the answer. So, what are your thoughts on Luciferianism? Do you think it is part of Satanism to be Luciferian? Uh, I, I will be doing more research on Luciferianism and the figure of Lucifer in the next weeks because I do have a paper on representations of Lucifer. That's my paper at the SW conference. Um, but um, yeah, I, it's difficult to say whether it's part of Satanism. I doubt it is, but it depends on the, um, yeah, on the definition, but yeah, I'm not sure. How would you define uh, Luciferianism? Now I'm, I'm curious about your definition. Oh, here there's talk about the egregore. An egregore is built up by working in a cult group. It is the collective consciousness of the group on a deep level. When done properly, it is very powerful. Um, this is interesting and it always reminds me of um, how, you know, uh, how deep Jung, uh, Carl Jung, influenced the, the occult and the perceptions of the occult. Because I think that one of the underlying philosophical assumptions behind the egregore is that there is something akin to the collective unconscious and uh, also that symbology bears power. I think that these two concepts that are um, found in Jung 
sort of uh, are two underlying uh, philosophical concepts that you find uh, behind the idea of the egregore? So let me see if there are other questions. Oh, James says um, that would be interesting, the gypsies. <laughs> Yeah, but I imagine that would be controversial now to study some, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking about um, the, the folk belief that uh, even the, the tarot come from the gypsies and that there is some connection between uh, between them. Andrew says that uh, the term which doctor was used to describe practitioners who treated people afflicted by baneful witchcraft. Professor Hutton's book, The Witch, talks about it. Yeah, I actually met Professor Ronald Hutton the other week. <laughs> we had dinner together and um, there's also a, um, an interview on my YouTube channel to Professor Ronald Hutton and we talk about magic in, in paganism. And he's sort of a superstar in in pagan studies, and I'm I'm quite happy that he's fond of uh, of my work, uh, and I'm definitely fond of his work. In fact, one of the first thing I think that I may have appeared to him as a I don't know a fan girl <laughs> the first time that I met him a few years ago when I was in the first year of my PhD, and when I met him at a conference, I was. Ah, you know, super excited, and I told him like a thousand times that I admired his work, and I tried to read *The Triumph of the Moon* when I wasn't very proficient at English, so <laughs> I had all sorts of annotations on the book um, because I was looking up terms, you know, um, from English to Italian to see what the tr translation was, and I was annotating. I think that I still. I may still have a copy at home of that book with all the the annotations penciled <laughs> on the on the single words but um yeah I think that I really admire Ron Hutton and it's one of those cases where you admire somebody it's like it's your academic hero and then you meet him and um you realize that he he's also uh, a great gentleman a bit like with uh, Jenny Butler, she's also really, really nice and super sweet. So, how long do you think people on Earth de deny the Divine Feminine, the, the Divine Feminine, High Priestess, etc.? Et I'm not sure what you mean. Do you mean... Um, how long has the divine feminine been denied? But um, I wouldn't put it in, in those terms, uh, but uh, definitely in the past <laughs> few millennia, or at least in Western countries, you have that the divine feminine uh, has not been particularly emphasized in religious practices. Uh, but um yeah i wouldn't say it was denied per se uh but yeah oh sorry mm -hmm. let me see if there are other questions oh a high desert w, w o <laughs> Hi Desert004, <laughs> I hope I'm pronouncing your nickname right. As an academic, what are your thoughts on theories of a primordial civilization, aka Atlantis, or something existing in prehistorian past? That's a good question. Uh, so there is no evidence that these civilizations have um, ever existed, to my knowledge. If you have any peer-reviewed academic um, 
scholarship on the matter and uh, you know books written by PhDs not with academic publishers don't count because I have a PhD but in a couple of years I may very well write a novel or just talk about my beliefs in public and write a book about my beliefs but that doesn't make the book academic uh, what makes a work academic is the methodology and it is the peer review process that it goes through so um, that's a, a bit of a um, I'm going on a tangent here but um, yeah I think that the idea of the primordial civilizations is a very um, a concept that was very dear to the 20th century for instance you find that in Michaliade but also in other um, uh, other scholars the idea that they wanted to find the primordial religion or the primordial civilization something that comes before uh, what we know I think that it is alluring in terms of trying to find this kind of golden age that we can learn from that was uh, hidden um, by history and is not uh, was not reported on history books but most of these are um, you know concepts that uh, sort of mythological mythologizations how can I put it it is a way of mythologizing a yearning that human beings have for something that goes beyond and something that comes first something that is primordial that is untouched that is pristine um, I think that uh, especially those that are interested in spirituality and historicism and the occult uh, sometimes you find that they have the perception that um, human behavior and human society tends to taint in a way the spiritual experience and so there is a sort of yearning for something that is untainted <laughs> by certain aspects of human experience and human society so that is my guess um, but um, what else did I want to say yeah, I think this idea of the primordial, uh, it, it always reminds me of Mitchell Eliade. I'm not sure if you're familiar with him. Um, I really like his work and he's very famous among shamanic practitioners because he talked a lot about shamanism. Uh, not only shamanism, but um, yeah, I think that this is a very 20th century idea, trying to find the, the source, the, the beginning. So what is the difference between alchemy and chemistry and when did one cross over into the other? So to my knowledge, the it, well, it depends if you intend alchemy in post Jungian terms or not in symbolic, in symbolic terms or not or not. So if you intend alchemy as what happened uh, in history so alchemy was the proto chemistry the difference between alchemy and chemistry when the you know the switch happened between the two is that alchemy was trying to change metal and substances um, you know in a very physical way but there was also an element of um, of the occult that was into that was brought into into that so um, it, it is it, it would be considered a proto chemistry because chemistry only tries to understand the um, uh, the, the physical world and how it works and how things turn into each other and how things uh, get together you know different agents get together and form a new agent only from a purely physical point of view only studying the matter the physical matter whereas in alchemy you also have an element from um, that we would consider occult so for instance whether the the planets would influence the the change of metals and uh, whether um, you know astrological elements or um, other uh, things that we would now call correspondences would affect the um, how you know um, how things in in reality in the physical world uh, change and get altered 
And that is not something that you find only with alchemy, but also with other um, forms of natural science. You know that in the I mentioned in the past that in the Renaissance, for instance, you would have that natural philosophy. So you would have natural magic and natural philosophy. Natural philosophy was what we would now call science. It was the study of the physical world but they would call it natural philosophy. And at the time, it would also include elements that we would now call es esoteric or occult. And then natural magic was the, uh, the, the practical aspect of natural philosophy. So at the time, especially in the Italian Renaissance, you would have the natural magic was the practical side of science, of natural philosophy. And then it is only after the enlightenment that you have the separation of the disciplines of disciplines and you have that when you deal with chemistry you only deal with chemistry and uh that and th there is the disenchantment of uh, all of these disciplines what max weber said in um science as a vocation he said that modernity is um one of the traits of modernity is the disenchantment of the world, that things are not enchanted anymore. So you look at the material world just in its material, um, only, you know, from its material perspective. And uh, there is some sort of dualism, a Cartesian dualism between matter and the metaphysical that starts to play a massive role in how we started to understand the world after modernity and after the Enlightenment especially. So after the Enlightenment, you have the idea that you have the separation of all of the disciplines. And also you have the sense that when something, when you study something that is material, uh, nothing outside of the material world, of the physical, tangible world, is affecting what it is that you are studying. So chemistry, after after that uh, sort of shift, uh, of course, also pertains uh, to um, only pertains to the physical world. I hope that answers the question. So. Um, Hi, Oflameo. So I want to learn more about Neoplatonism. What are the best uh, resources for that? So uh, I have a, a video on Neoplatonism. It was actually a live stream lecture. So uh, you might want to look at that one. And there are also resources in the info box. So Andrew, please, if you can also link that one in the chat box, it would be appreciated. So look up in the in the chat because Andrew is going to link that video. Um, but yeah, there are uh, there are quite a few resources, but now I cannot remember them off the top of my head. But uh, they are listed in in that video in the info box. And thank you for the super chat. So let me see if there are other questions. <laughs> Neopaganism, caps lock. What about it? <laughs> <laughs> Unless it was an un a reply to what somebody else was saying, but it made me laugh. So, but yeah, I can see in the chat that there is that there are still conversations around Atlantis and um, so, as I said, I ne I try to always be very respectful of people's beliefs, and this is I guess also part of my academic training as uh, an anthropologist because I work with people and I value greatly what people believe and how they construct meaning. So I'm not judgmental in that sense. Uh, but when we talk about history, then it's important to acknowledge the difference between a belief that you may hold in symbolic term, mythological terms, or whatever it is that, um, whatever it is the way that you construct your belief and the historical evidence. 
uh, the two things don't necessarily have to go hand in hand. So you can believe something even if it's not possible to, to prove it, I guess. But it's also important to acknowledge that, you know, what the facts are and the historical, what the historical evidence suggests. So Alan is asking, what would you suggest to beginners in the occult? How to start practicing? Which academic course should I study? So do you want to study the occult as an academic or do you want to study the occult as a practitioner? Because that's a, there's a big difference there. If you want to study as an acad as, you know, in academic terms, I would recommend the University of Amsterdam. Uh, I think that they are sort of the the most famous <laughs> in the world um, who um, work on esotericism and the, the occult from an academic point of view. They have a big department of um, history of hermetic philosophy and related currents. And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. And um, head of the um, department is Professor Marco Passi, who has been on my YouTube channel before. So, and I look forward to seeing him in, in Cork, uh, in Ireland for the, the conference. But, um, yeah, I would say, uh, if you're interested in the occult from an academic point of view, like you want to take a course, I would recommend University of Amsterdam. Otherwise, I would say there are many, many academic books that you can study, uh, to get knowledge on on these topics and it really depends on what you're most interested in so i would say follow your curiosity and follow what resonates with you and uh, for a lot of things you will find videos on my youtube channel and then you can in the info box of all of my videos there are references that you can look at uh, but yeah i think that there is um, an encyclopedia of Gnosis and Western historicism. I have referenced it a few times um, in the info box of my videos. It is edited by Wouter Anegraf and that could be useful so that you can get um, sort of a taste of all the different traditions. So yeah, maybe look up the info box of one of my Rosicrucianism videos because I have referenced that, that book. That, that one might be useful because you would have an immense variety of practices and traditions and uh, then you can choose after you have uh, a broad understanding of what uh, they are talking about. So... <clears throat> Sorry if this has been answered. How do you feel about the hermetic principles, especially as set forth in the Kibalion or Kubalion? Um, that's a, a topic that deserves a video on its own. I was even thinking of doing a collaboration with uh, Justin about it, actually. We, we briefly talked about it and then we haven't <laughs> we haven't done it but that is something that i'd like to discuss further so yeah bear with me and you will get more on the on the matter Oh, this is interesting from Joao, one of my patrons. Um, he says the Atlantis myth hunt, the Atlantis myth hunt started in the interbellum United States. Look at Ignatius Donalist's work. He also wrote about other mythical places like Lemuria. Yeah, thank you, Joao. See, my patrons are. Um, very very brilliant and interesting and this month we will have a um, magus lecture on magic in theory and practice by lester crowley we did um a lecture on that book even last month but i realized 
that it took much longer than two hours to address it, especially part three, which is about uh, the concept of magic in and of itself. And we will address that in the next Magus lecture. Um, so if you're interested, you would like you might want to join my patron as a Magus so that uh, you can participate with that event, but also access the database of all the previous lectures because they are all recorded and they uh, stay on my patron. So uh, if you join my patron as a Magus, you can also access previous Magus lectures. Yes, I would agree with you, James. Um, it's only marginally hermetic, yes. It's more of a, um, it's a new interpretation, perhaps we could say, of Hermetic philosophy. So, let me see if there are any questions that I've missed. Oh, <laughs> you had the deja vu. <laughs> when I mentioned the thing about neo-paganism, maybe that's why I mentioned it. You know, I, I said it out loud, even though it was not really a question. Yes, neo-paganism, not neo-platonism. <laughs> I'm confusing neo-platonism and neo-paganism. <laughs> so, he's a hermetic philosophy born out of ancient Egyptian philosophy. Um, there are claims regarding that. But um, not historically. Uh, it's more about the um, an imagined Egyptian philosophy rather than the actual Egyptian philosophy. It's more the imagery and the sim the symbology and the mythology around the Egyptian philosophy. The e Egyptian philosophy that was um, feathered later on you know, during the uh, medieval times. But I wouldn't say specifically that it comes from Egyptian philosophy. So have you done uh, any research into specifically Celtic Irish magic witchcraft? And will you be making a video on that at any point? I have a video on the goddess Morrigan and I have interviews to Dr. Jenny Butler. So she's the one that uh, does research on uh, Irish uh, witchcraft, paganism, um, and mythology. So you might want to look at her work and also the interviews we did on our YouTube channel. And perhaps I could do another interview when I'm in Ireland in Cork. So that would be fun. So, yeah, I guess that we can end the live stream here then. And um, before I wrap up, I'd like to remind all of you guys that uh, this project can heal on not only the live streams, but also the, the videos and the whole Angela Symposium can really only exist thanks to your support. So if you like my project and want me to keep the academic fund going, I, I would really appreciate if you would consider supporting my work with a one-off PayPal donation by joining memberships or my inner symposium on Patreon. All the links are usually in a pinned comment on all of my videos and uh, it will they will also be <laughs> under this video once the live stream is as ended because before for some reason I cannot um, I cannot write a comment but uh, yeah I would really appreciate any kind of help you could give because this project is really 
only possible thanks to you guys and thanks to very generous patrons such as uh, James Vitale who has helped this project immensely. So I really thank um, all of those who have supported my work and those who are um, you know, part of my patron community or part of the membership program or have sent donations or will be sending donations. So thanks to all of you because of course you make this project um, going and you make it possible and you keep it going. So um, yeah, and um, if you are watching this now or if you're watching it later, and if you liked it, <laughs> don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, activate the notification bell so that you will never miss a new upload from me. And uh, as always, stay tuned for all the academic fun. Bye for now. And thanks for being here. <laughs>